Right, so good evening to you colleagues. Uh, I would like to welcome you to our first official session for AUI 3702. So why, why is this document open is I just want to take briefly to, to the part where I gave an outline or rather a module outline. So you would notice that um, how AUI 3702 is structured is that, um, first of all, in terms of assignments, there are four typical assignments of note for the module, as they have already indicated through the orientation. Um, two of these will be MCQ assignments. The first one I think is already passed. I'm not sure if the lecture have extended, but if they have extended and if you have not done it, please ensure that you go through the My Unisa platform just to assess if ever the assignment is still available for you to complete it. If you need assistance on that, please do get a hold of me so that I can be able to, to help you. Right. And then the other two assignments, which is assignment three and four, those ones are written or essay based assignments. So they'll be typical written questions, really. That's what they, 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 they are. I'm talking of assignment three and assignment four. For exam purposes now, this is now insight information I'm about to give you. Exam, the exam of AUI 3702 changed um, into being an online exam. So it, it, it used to be a paper-based exam, right? Where you would have typical MCQ questions and the rest of the questions will be essay-based or written, uh, written questions. But they've made adjustments or changes to that. And now it's, it's, it's a typical setup of MCQ questions. You've got, um, I think from, okay, there's MCQ questions, then there's matching questions, then there will be a, like written questions as well. So that is how the, 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 the setup of the exam now looks like. Now, so having said that, um, from past experience, what I've picked up, which is critical, especially addressing the written part of it, because there's a lot of marks for the written questions for exam purposes. Just a second, I need to put the laptop on the charger. So there is a lot of marks that is allocated for the written section of the exam, right? Then the MCQ questions are okay. They are really not bad. Uh, they're just similar to what you would look at in the assignments. Um, so I think in any case, if you make a missed assignment one, if they have not extended it, I'll be able to show it to you with, with the second assignment because it will also be an MCQ assignment. Now, having said all of that, where is our point of departure from here? We've got seven critical topics which we need to cover within, I think, a space spectrum of three months. Now, how do we ensure that we are able to achieve all the objectives with, within these um, seven respective uh, modules? So here is how my approach is for, for this module, because I've looked at different questions, the approach of testing that they've used in the past from assignments perspective, examination questions perspective. So from my analogy and what, how I'm going to be approaching this is I'm gonna approach it from a sense of teaching you things that helps you guys to accumulate marks, especially on questions that have got a lot of marks for exam purposes for that matter. So the topic which is critical for this module is topic number six, where you begin to be introduced to what I call business cycle. So that would be our central point of departure. So to do that, my sisters, I'm going to quickly take you, first of all, through a whiteboard screen. And on this whiteboard screen, I'm going to give you guys a mind map of the different business cycles that are important for this module. Right. So observe here now the following business cycles. And I just want to explain something to you that when you're dealing with business cycles, you need to understand, okay, what exactly is a business cycle? What, what, what does it mean in auditing terms? So business cycles in, from an auditing perspective, it, it's basically one and the same thing as saying a process activity. So if I go to a business entity, any form of business entity, doesn't matter what industry they are in, there's a form of a cycle that they follow almost on a daily basis which is what is then known or described as their day-to-day -day business activities. So those day-to-day -day business activities, they can be broken down into cycles because it's something that they're doing almost 
on a day-to-day -day basis, basis or on an ongoing basis. So this can be classified as number one, revenue and receipt cycle, which is the first one that I'll deal with for today in this engagement. Then number two, acquisition acquisition and payment cycle equally important is number 3 inventory and production cycle Number four, as well, equally and very, very, very important, particularly for exam purposes, it's payroll. And personnel cycle. And then lastly, but not least, also equally important, but not extremely important because they don't test it much in the exam. It's um, finance and investment cycle. They don't test much about this one, but it's just to be enlisted anyway for, for, for completeness purposes. So it's finance and investments. business cycle. So uh, colleagues, these are the five important business cycles to note. Five important business cycles to note. So there's revenue and receipt cycle, which is where our point of departure will be in this session, followed by acquisition and payment cycle, inventory and production cycle, payroll and personnel cycle, and then finance and investment. So before I begin to unveil more details on the revenue and receipt cycle. Here's what I'm going to say about all the cycles individually and because it's important that you understand what is the purpose of each one of them. So if I'm looking at revenue and receipt cycle, the core behind a revenue and receipt cycle is this. The essence behind it and from a management perspective is that they, they intend to generate revenue. So it's, it, 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 the objective overall is to generate revenue or to make sales. That, that's really the revenue and receipt cycle. So that is the core behind that cycle, sales or generating revenue for the business. With the acquisitions and payment cycle, the core behind that cycle is procurement, procurement of goods or services. So the same thing with the revenue, you need to understand that uh, when you are selling something, it can either be a tangible commodity or it can be something that is in intangible format, meaning to say um, it's, it's a service for that matter. So we can either make revenue by selling physical goods or by selling a service to, to our clients or to our customers. Good example of a service is tutorial services as it is with what I'm uh, you know, offering to you guys right now. So we call this one service, but it's a form of a product as well, right? Then of course we've got inventory and production cycle. The core behind inventory and production cycle is that um, they intend to produce or manufacture a product, physical product, which will in turn be sold to the intended user. I repeat, with the inventory and production cycle, the core behind it is to, to produce or to manufacture a product with the intent to sell it to them designated user, all right, or the end user for that matter. So one of the key things you discover with inventory and production cycle, we break inventory into three stages, namely the raw material stage, the work in progress stage, and the finished product or finished goods stage. But I'm going to unveil that when we get to the inventory and production cycle um, concept as in detail. Then, of course, you've got payroll and personnel cycle. This one is a very, 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 very important cycle because 
Normally, they bring it, you find it can be 30 marks in the exam. It can also be equally a lot of marks even for assignment purposes. So it's very important. Please watch out for this payroll and personnel cycle. They love testing you on this quite often. So it's important you really have a good understanding of um, how that cycle really functions. But essentially, it has got two main objectives in it. So the part, the first part is payroll, right? So payroll it has to do with ensuring that the company pays um, correct salary or wages to their employees. So they are paying for the actual work done by an employee. That's payroll. So it, it, when, when I look at payroll now, I should be thinking of it from an accounting perspective to say, uh, we just want to ensure that there's accuracy of amounts, completeness of, 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 of amounts as well for a particular financial period or accounting period. So this is now where we also begin to think of what I would call accounting assertions or assertions rather. Two types of assertions you're going to observe, particularly when you deal with this one. And I'm saying these things for uh, when I begin to talk about audit procedures. So you've got assertions for uh, transactions and records, and then you've got assertions for account balances. So it's very, very important that when we deal with this, um, we, we take note of that. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share on it when we, when we, when we really cross that bridge. Then the last one is finance uh, and investment cycle. Now, it's not that much tested really from past experience and past exposure. They don't speak much about finance investment. I can assure you, going to different assignments um, in the previous semesters, you observe they hardly talk much about finance and investment cycle, though they might ask a question here and there in the multiple, multiple choice setup, but nothing much really. Now, having said this, colleagues, we are going to begin from here. Um, we're going to begin from here. That's where our journey for tonight begins. So what is it that I need to know when I'm dealing with cycles? Whether it's revenue and receipt, acquisitions and payment, it's payroll and personnel cycle, what exactly is it that I need to know? And why do I need to know this? Because it can be tested for assignment or exam purposes. So here are the few important things I'm gonna enlist. So I call this one assumed knowledge, okay? So what I'm giving you right now is the assumed knowledge. In other words, these are things that you are expected to know when it comes to cycle, assumed knowledge. Assumed knowledge. Number one, when you're dealing with a cycle, a business cycle, you need to understand what are the functions in place. functions in place, which is also known as phases within that cycle. Because a cycle is something that goes through stages, right? Or phases or functions. So you need to know the phases, the functions or stages within, within that particular cycle. That's number one. Number two, you need to be able to identify people involved. or identify the respective departments in place at each of those respective stages. And we're going to do that practically with the revenue end and receipt cycle. Then number three, after we've identified the people or the departments within each of those respective functions uh, in the cycle, the next thing I should be able to do is to identify The specific documents and records generated at each of those respective stages. I need to know specific records, specific documents that they generate. So very important as an, um, a typical important note here, there is need for what I would call specificity, specificity. Why I'm saying this need for specificity is because when you're dealing with procedures, one of the things you're going to do with documents, you inspect the document. So when you inspect a document, you need to be very precise to the examiner to say, what type of document are you inspecting? Are you inspecting 
a sales invoice? Are you inspecting some supporting documents in form of order forms, goods requisition forms, um, delivery notes, minutes of um, the director's meeting, you know, all those things. So when you are dealing with documents or even records for that matter, maybe it's a general, a sales journal that you're inspecting, you need to be very precise to say, okay, this is the document that I'm inspecting. You see the same thing being true when you're dealing with people as well. Because when you deal with people, one of the things you do is to observe people performing a specific function or performing a specific uh, activity rather within a cycle. So one of the ways I can be able to draw evidence on what they're doing is by observing them. But now there are different types of people, different titles of people within an organization. I should be able to be specific as well with the people that I'm observing. Not only do we observe people performing specific activities, but we also inquire. In other words, we ask questions from people, be it management or normal common employees in the organization. We can actually ask them questions. So when we ask them questions, I need to be, I, to be able to identify the, the specific person that I'm asking questions from. Don't use names under normally normal circumstances. So let's say, for example, inquire from management. Now, oh, be specific which management are you dealing with. Maybe it's the warehouse manager. So inquire from the warehouse manager. Why are you inquiring from the warehouse manager to determine whether there is inventory records being conducted for the warehouse area? I'm just giving that as a common uh, standardized procedure you can perform dealing with a person for that matter. Or I can observe who? Observe the warehouse employees, all right, upon entering and exiting the company premises or the warehouse area to determine whether there is appropriate access controls in place in the organization. Why am I doing all those? And I want you to observe, um, besides explaining why, the common thing is I'm being specific. I'm being specific with, this, with the person that I'm observing or I'm being specific with the person I'm inquiring if I'm asking questions from that individual. So the same thing is true even when I'm dealing with people. And uh, just another important thing I could add as well, number four, if there is anything um, physical in the form of assets, please be able to identify it as well. And so if I'm identifying physical assets in the cycle, I need to be very specific as well. Say, which assets are we dealing with here? And with assets, I'm referring to inventory, for example, if we are selling. So we need to be able to be, um, we need to be able to identify the type of inventory which the organization is selling. How do I know what inventory goods they're selling? Normally, if I go through what I call a system description or a case, just a basic case study in the exam, that's what is known as a system description. So for exam purposes, don't ever mess up your mind by thinking, well, they said a system description. What exactly are they referring to? It's just a simple, uh, or rather I would say a fancy name for saying the, the case study scenario. So they can say give audit procedures from the given system description. All they're simply saying is give audit procedures from the above mentioned case study. That's all they are simply referring to. So be familiar with those things, but very important uh, when it comes to physical assets, we identify the physical assets based on what they've given us in the case study scenario. So also again, there's need for specificity as well, specificity or clarity rather, so to speak. Right, so these are important things that you really need to know when you're dealing with the functions. Then the next thing I'm about to show you is what can be examinable. So I call this one examinable items. That's why they are in red, because this then would give you ideas of what questions do they ask. So number one, they can ask you to identify weaknesses in the cycle. Usually when they ask you to identify a weakness in the cycle, your second question could be to give recommendations. Ah, 
other than asking you to identify weaknesses and giving recommendations, they can also ask you to identify risks in the given scenario. And likewise, they will ask you next to give a recommendation to address the identified risk, okay? Or they can ask you to do the following, to perform audit procedures. With audit procedures, there's two types of audit procedures you're going to perform for this module. There is test of controls and substantive audit procedures. Substantive audit procedures. Now, substantive audit procedures they are more relative to in a case where there's money involved or where there's finance uh, items really related. That's, that's where you perform um, substantive audit procedures. But I'll explain all those things to you line by line, line so that you, you really understand them. Then number five, they can also ask you to give audit objectives. Give audit objectives very 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 important there's a way of drafting all these things okay so um in a sense these are common things okay well obviously then the other things they're just as extras not to say they always ask them like that number six to identify documents in a depending of course with the cycle to identify documents and sometimes even to identify the records themselves okay so those are some of the common common examinable items or examinable questions when it comes to cycles these should be the standardized things you must know and i'm going to teach you step by step one by one so you really um can be as confident to approach any question whether they're asking you to identify weaknesses and to give recommendations and maybe you're looking at acquisitions and payment or maybe you're looking at payroll and personnel cycle you should be comfortable to uh, to draft witnesses statements and then to give the relevant uh, corresponding recommendations as well so very very important this is our point of departure so what have we done we've laid the foundation right from topic six concerning uh business cycle so i'm, I'm just going to indicate this is coming from topic six according to your study guide right so those are the cycles that you need to note and we're dealing with this one for today so i'm gonna get into just introduce i may not finish the entire cycle in one sitting but i'm, I'm gonna because I, because already i've covered a lot of information from from this introduction so i'm gonna just introduce the revenue and receipt cycle but we'll do it in two sitting right so business cycles and i've explained to you what you need to know concerning the cycles this is what we call assumed knowledge so you need to know the functions the phases and the stages who are the relevant people involved within those respective stages and identify the documents and records or even possibly even the assets as well so hence you see my notes now the way i've summarized notes on inventory i mean sorry on cycles it looks like this it's in column format so you've got your uh, functions or stages like this. Stage number one is ordering. Stage number two is granting of credit. Stage number three is shipping products or the same thing as known as warehousing. Uh, fourth stage or function is invoicing the customer. Um, and then the, the fifth stage is called receipt of payment or receipts and sales recording. That is number five. So all these are the functions, all those stages that I was talking about from the whiteboard screen, right? And I'm, I, I was saying to you from the whiteboard screen that under each of these respective stages, respective functions of the cycle, I need to be able to identify who are the parties involved in the sense of saying people involved, 
all the de designated divisions or departments in the company that is involved in performing that particular function or stage in the cycle. And then the next step I need to be able to do is to then also begin to identify the documents and the reports that are generated at each of those respective, respective stages. And then for exam purposes, possible things they can ask you are risks for the different stages or functions within the cycle. I should be able to do all these things at the end of, um, you know, having studied the first two things about the uh, first three things of this cycle, revenue and receipt cycle. So I'm going to take you through all of that. But before I do that, just to come back to our whiteboard so that we know that we've uh, covered at least everything that we need to know in, in, in the sense of saying, when I begin to unveil about cycles, this is what I need to know. Assumed knowledge, guys, this is NB. You can structure your notes in this order, the way I've done it. So this also gives you a framework, just exactly like what I'm showing on the PDF, column formats like that. I'm not saying that is the comprehensive summary of the revenue and receipt cycle, but I, the reason why I did it like that is because I wanted to make it easier for you as students to summarize your cycles without having to have 20 pages of summarizing one chapter, but you can just have three pages to summarize one chapter. Maybe you say you can literally uh, you know, have your notes in your hands like this. Just before the exam, you can look at them like this. But now think about it if you've got a 20 page summary of one topic. It's, it's too much, you know, I, well, in my opinion, I always like to simplify um, my, my study. So I don't like to complicate things. I find, I just need to think about the easiest way to summarize the concept for myself and pinpoint important things. That's exactly what I call assumed knowledge. So when I'm saying assumed knowledge, I'm saying pinpoint key or critical information that you need to know from that particular so, uh, you know, subject matter or topic. That's assumed knowledge. And then of course, we look at the specificity now in the sense of what can be then asked as far as my understanding of the assumed knowledge for that uh, particular subject area is concerned. And those are the six items that have been listed for you there. So we're gonna do this now uh, through the revenue and receipt cycle to start with. So let's go there. And let's have a look at the cycle. So now, uh, colleagues, I want you to observe, <clears throat> this is a revenue and receipt cycle. And these are the stages. But before I take you through my summary, I just wanna give reference to some important sources that you can make use of as your extra study or extra, um, you know, yeah, study rather. Revenue and receipt cycle in this particular textbook, which I'm about to show you now, it's called Audit Notes or Jackson and Stent, right? Majority of the questions uh, that are tested by UNISA, concerning auditing, they come through this book. So it's very important that I outline that to you. You notice that I've never really mentioned much about this, for example, during the orientation, because this is valued information that I can only give to people in the inner circle. Colleagues, this textbook is very critical and important. Yes, you've got a performance of audit engagements, textbook, it's okay. But this one for me, yeah. It, it makes life easier. So what I want you to observe is your cycles, they are all here, by the way, in this textbook, and I want you to observe them like this. Your revenue and receipt cycle, it's chapter number 10. Acquisitions and payment cycle, it's chapter number 11. Inventory and production cycle, it's chapter number 12. Payroll and personnel cycle, it's chapter number 13. Finance and investment cycle is Chapter number 14. Let me start off with chapter number 10, just to show you what you need to know, what you're going to pick from this, from this book. So one of the key things, uh, look, it's, it, this particular book does is it details what you need to know for that uh, cycle, but in a more comprehensive uh, format. So one of the things um, for, 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 for interest sake that I just want you to pick from here is, uh, you know, just the theoretical background of the cycle, you know, like, for example, characteristics of the cycle, I think it's just some of those things to help you familiarize yourself to say, okay, with revenue and receipt cycle, these are common things that should be able to note for me to know that, okay, this company is definitely involved in a revenue and receipt, uh, receipt cycle. 
Same thing with the documents. See, if you want to study the documents that they use at each stage, just go there. It, it also sort of like gives you that outline, okay? Also from a pictorial point of view, what do I mean when I'm saying pictorial point of view? So if I want to picture the revenue and receipt cycle in a system flow, there are flow charts depicting how this particular process works. And I'm going to show you how you make use of flow charts, even when you're answering a question in an exam situation, you can draw some sort of like a flow chart showing you, for example, where the process of, um, you know, ordering begins, what happens after ordering until the customer has the product in their hands. You know, I'm going to show you all of that and how you can be able to then pick up to say, this is where the risks are. This is where weaknesses are. Well, if I know those things, how do I begin to solve these issues? That's where recommendations comes from. So recommendations, it's not something that you just think of out of the air, no. It's always directed towards a specific uh, weakness, a specific risk that you would have identified in the question. Yes, you, you can actually use that, that, that one from the book as well. Um, you, you can actually use the one from the book, but I, I've, I've got my ways of um, working around these things. I, I like to draw pictures, that's how my lecturer taught me actually. And I found that to be way easier when I'm analyzing a system, um, you know, a, in a question rather, right? Another thing I wanted you to, to see from this cycle is, is when it comes to procedures. I think if there's anything very important, I, I, I can advise you to draw from this is with regards to, to, to the procedures, because you're going to pick up the following. The outline about test of controls, how you perform tests of controls. They are outlined about substantive procedures, how you should draft substantive procedures. But I'm, I need to warn you on something, that you don't copy and paste what they've given there, because they'll give you, uh, I would say, just a framework of how you, you can formulate procedures uh, in the sense of substantive procedures or test of controls. But for every unique question, you need to be very specific to the documents for that particular organization if it's in a, in a typical exam question or in an assignment setup you need to that's why i was mentioning in the in the whiteboard specificity specificity because we, we are going to go through this um aspects on the of test of control substantive procedures as i'm showing you from the book so when i'm showing you this thing from the book i don't want you guys to be in a state where you can copy and that's just paste those things when you're performing test of controls or substantive procedures but i'll be showing you these things from the book just so that i give you a perspective of how these things should be formulated or how these things should be documented in a standardized way that your examiner wants that's why i will be taking you through this from the book you observe the same thing even when you go through acquisitions and payment cycle sorry about that you observe the same thing. There we go. You see them? Test of controls, substantive procedures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'll be showing you how you perform test of controls for for any cycle, really. All right. And the list goes on and on. But without further ado, I want to come back to the revenue and the receipt cycle, so that I can explain some important pointers from there. Okay, let me move to the bed. Okay. It's okay. okay. Um, just as yes. I just want to ask so far with everything that I've uh, taught you, I, I, are you guys making sense of any, everything that I'm teaching so far? Is, is it making sense to you? It's making sense because I did auditing. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's great. And for uh, Same thing. It? It's making sense I'm as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Lovely, lovely. That's great. I'm happy. I'm happy to hear that. Now, so colleagues, here's what I want you to pick now. Revenue and receipt cycle. So this, these are the stages uh, of not... Second, I need to get my mouse. Do this. Right, so we've got ordering. Now let's discuss ordering. What exactly transpires during ordering stage? So during the ordering stages uh, of the revenue and receipt cycle, 
we receive a customer order from the customer himself or herself. Um, very important, there is need for a sales authorization to take place when an order is received. Okay, and very important with sales authorization, it happens in two ways. It's either we're going to have cash sale or it's going to be a credit sale. So if it's a cash sale, it simply means that we are going to receive immediate payment for that particular transaction of a sale. If it's a credit sale, then it implies we need to then follow the next stage, which is called granting of credit before we can deliver the goods to the customer. Are we together? You're following so far? So with the cash sale, meaning when you sell something for cash immediately to the customer, it means we jump the, grant, the granting of credit stage. We simply then ship the product to the customer immediately after receiving the payment. Same thing with the invoicing, they all happens in real time if it's a cash sale. But then if there is a credit sale that is taking place, it means we might then ship the, pro yes, we ship the products, then we have to invoice the customer thereafter, then we record the sales transaction thereafter, which is then giving us this particular stage over there, which is receipt of payment or receipts and recording of a sale, right? So that's, that's, that's just to give you perspective now. Now let's look at ordering alone without looking, of course, at the rest of them now. Who are the people that we see? We see a customer involved or customers involved. We also observe a sales clerk or a sales personnel being part and parcel of that stage and which department really governs ordering. It's basically the marketing department or the sales department. They're the ones responsible for handling customer orders, right? So any person that you see, for example, if you go to a store uh, which is selling finished products, a good example, you know, you talk of your, 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 your food outlets, the people that you meet there directly at the till point, whom you place your orders with, we call those people sales clerk or sales personnel, following under the sales department, really, okay? So... That's the department that you see. In terms of people as well, those are the kind of people you see. So you see a customer, you see the salesperson, and the department responsible is the sales department. Talking of documents now, what documents do we observe when there is a sale that is being uh, performed? We see a customer order form being filled by the customer or completed by the customer because sales doesn't always happen in person. It can happen in different ways. And... Uh, the other ways which I can mention now to you is there's online sales that happens, and this is usually done through the e-commerce uh, platform of that particular entity in concern. There is also uh, orders that can be taken um, through through the company website itself, yeah, but that, that's anyways uh, the e-commerce or the online platform rather. It can also happen telephonically where a customer calls the organization to place their orders. It can happen via email you know, or any other form of medium that just uh, allows an interaction between the customer and, and the sales department of, an, of the organization in consent that wants to sell the product to the customer. So we get an order form in place. We also get to see uh, documents such as price lists. We see picking slips uh, being used. Why do we need picking slips? Why do we need price lists? Price lists are essential so that we can court correct and pre-approved prices of goods to the customer. That is why there is a uh, price list within the order department. And that some of these things, they actually put them on display for you as a customer to clearly observe it. So when you go to a food outlet, you, you, you observe they've got different screens there with uh, indication of different products or meals that they are selling to you. And you notice they will put the price of that a particular type of a meal that you might want to buy. What are they doing there? They're displaying the prices for you. So that's, that's, that's really the purpose behind the prices is to court correct prices to the customer, all right? And the picking slip now is something that they use internally. This is like what I call an internal sales order. So it's a document that is then used to be able to allow the warehouse personnel to pick the correct ordered good from the warehouse area, which can then be given to the sales department or to 
uh, directly to the customer anyways. So in the case of retail, real-time real sales, we will need a, an internal sales or a, a picking slip. So uh, I want you to think of these things practically. So you are in a food outlet, you're placing an order for a meal, they give you a receipt, right, of your order. That's just basically a copy of the order anyways. They keep the original copy of the order in the system. But at the same time, you begin to discover that the people who are in the kitchen, they already, they already begin to prepare the meal that you've ordered at the till point. Then you wonder, how is it that they knew that now they are supposed to prepare this particular type of a meal that, if you're, that I've ordered? Well, that is where picking slips comes in, which is also the same thing as called an internal sales order. So it is sent directly to the kitchen people so that they know, okay, now we need to prepare order number so, so, so. These are the items that we need to be preparing to satisfy that order. All right? But in the case where it's, uh, you know, it's not food, it's something else like a physical, I mean, just not food per se, then it, the person might need to take that internal sales order to go and pick the relevant item in the warehouse area or in the storeroom, which then can be used um, to effect the sales to the customer for that matter. So these are common documents which we see or observe during the ordering, the ordering of goods stage. Now, what about if we are selling goods on credit then? It's not just a cash sale that we are doing. We order, I mean, we sell goods to customers on credit. We need to perform granting of credit. And that is something that is done by a separate department apart from sales department. And that department is called the con credit control department. And there we find an individual or personnel called credit, credit managers or credit controllers. So they're the people that are, responsible for handling the credit granting process of an organization. Their objective is to ensure that goods are sold to credit worthy customers. In other words, they are sold to customers that can actually pay or afford to pay for the goods that are sold on credit to them. Documentations you will see or observe being generated could be a copy of a customer order. Notice there's a copy and original from here during the ordering stage. This department keeps the original. They give you a copy to, as a customer, but they also send another copy to the credit granting state, I mean, department. In any case, if they want, I mean, you know, they need to assess your credit worthiness before they can actually effect the sale or authorize the sale for that matter. So we see a copy of a customer order. So this is a copy colleagues. And then we see proof of incomes being made, which can come in form, different forms. Uh, for example, banks, I mean, you can make use of three months bank statements or your pay slip from where you're working. Proof of employment, all these things are needed uh, by the credit granting uh, department so that they just make or uh, perform background assessments of what, what I would call background checks to assess your credit worthiness. Um, as a customer before they can actually authorize the, the credit sale. And from there, if they are happy that, okay, fine, you can afford to pay for the product, then they can ship the products to you. Or if you're in store, then there, they give you the product on credit right there in real time. And guess what they do? They invoice you accordingly. And at the same time, they can even make the recording of the sale. So we can also begin to see this, uh, this particular stage is happening in the same day at the same time or it can happen um maybe some of the other stages like invoicing it can happen later so they can ship the product to you and then maybe the following day day after they send an invoice to you and then they capture the sales day after does it make sense so but i, I think now in the modern modern uh, modern days we are living in things are happening a lot in real time so these trans i mean these stages or functions here they happen in real time majority of them so the, during the shipment of products, this is where we see the warehouse department coming into the picture. And here's what you see. Very important. In the warehouse, there are different sections in the warehouse, which I just want to quickly um, outline for you here before I talk about the people. So we see the storage of goods. All right. So there's a storage section in the warehouse where the goods will be picked before they can be loaded on the trucks for dispatch. And then we've got a dispatch section. This is now where the trucks, which are loading goods to dispatch to customers are, you know, are parked, or that's where they, they, are, they, 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 they normally pick the goods to be delivered to the customers. Another section, which I'll 
which I, I will just mention, but I will not talk about in detail as yet on, on this one. It's, it's called receiving section. So in the receiving section of the warehouse, normally we have that section in the case where we are receiving goods from a supplier uh, somewhere. So when they deliver goods to us now, so suppose in this case, we are the ones buying. When they deliver to us, we receive this good at the receiving section of the warehouse. So all these are sections of the warehouse, three designated sections. There's receiving, there's storage, then there's dispatch. So for revenue and receipts, we deal with two. Uh, there's dispatch and the storage, storage section. So uh, that's what you normally see when you're dealing with shipping or warehousing. So typ typically, the people or departments involved is the warehouse, department with the warehouse manager being there and there were for example you also have like warehouse um junior warehouse clerks or you see get controllers dispatch personnel that's basically the warehouse clerks and then the, the delivery driver as well being involved in that in that particular process um just to add to it you also begin to see the customer anyway when this the goods are actually dispatched to the customer anyways so now Documents in place which are used there, it's the copy of the customer order. It has to be used, and that is in form of that picking slip, internal sales order. And we also, we also begin to see the just a copy, of course, of the actual order itself. Then the delivery notes are generated right there, and they're given to the drivers, which would then be signed by the customer upon delivery to the, of goods to the customer. And we also begin to see dispatch lists being used at the warehouse section. Dispatch list is just there to um, indicate how many goods have been dispatched and to who, at what time, by who. In other words, the driver responsible for doing that. So very important, all these are typical documents you begin to see during the warehousing or shipping of product stage. Then obviously we invoice the customer now. When we invoice, the moment you hear the word invoice, you must think of the accounting department. So relevant personnel in the case of revenue and receipt, we have got the accounts receivable personnel, all right, what they call a data slack. That is the person responsible, especially for invoicing customers. And they also responsible for following up with customers in terms of outstanding payment. So typical documents you see, again, you see a copy of the customer order to use, um, to generate obviously the, the actual invoice. And in this case, it's called a tax invoice. And um, there are other documents, I just didn't outline them there. When you're invoicing a customer, um, we also begin to see, for example, uh, Subse okay, we, we begin to see uh, edge analysis. I wanted to actually say the edge analysis. It's also used right there during the invoicing stage. So we created edge analysis to say, okay, this person, if it's the, 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 the individual has bought goods on credit, okay, for how long is the credit gonna be? Is it 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? So we also make use of that during the invoicing stage. So the uh, data's edge analysis, by the way, it's, it's generated from that stage. And then we do the recording in the journals, like uh, we call the, the, the that particular journal sales journal, and and so on. So we debit the data's control, and then we credit the sales. That's the normal accounting recording of this, right? And then of course, once we've invoiced the customer, we capture this information. Uh, supposing if we receive a payment there and there, we need to receipt the customer for for for, for the payment they've made. So we, we, with this again is within the accounting department, but it's handled by a personnel called a cash, cash book clerk, right? Or an, or an accountant, typically. That is the person responsible for that. And the documents you see is the remittance advice, receipts of payment, bank statements for clients that are paying directly to our bank account in form of EFTs. And then we also, um, you know, observe the data's age analysis. It has to be adjusted once a customer pays, you know, and this is to account for things like discounts. Because for example, companies have got what we call uh, credit terms. So the credit terms, it's something like, if you pay within 30 days, then you get 5% discount, you know? Or if you pay then there within 15 days, you get a settlement discount, you know? All those kind of gist. So all those things are accounted for when we receipt or record the sales transaction of the client. And then of course, we also see things like memos, you know, uh, or some form of record keeping that they just, you know, indicate to say this customer is paid. It's all generated right at that stage. Another stage, which I just didn't indicate here, it's called um, goods received notes. Uh, yeah, that one is normally um, where a customer, for example, 
Yes, after receiving the goods, they are not happy with the goods that they bought. Maybe because there's faulty with the goods. So what they will do is they will return back the goods to us. Okay? They will return the goods back to us. They will fill in their goods received. Um, not document. Or actually, it's not a goods received. It's a, it's a credit note. So they will indicate that and then they'll send it to us. And um, no, it's not, a, it's not a credit note. It's a debit note. So they'll, they'll fill it in themselves. Suppose, it's, especially if it's a company that's, uh, that, that is um, not able with the goods they've received from the supply. So they'll fill in that document, send it to the supplier, and the supplier will issue a credit note. So that's how that, that whole procedure functions. So colleagues, what have we done? I've explained to you the functions in the revenue and receipts cycle. I've explained to you the different people you observe within each one of those stages in this cycle. I've also outlined documents and records that are used within this cycle. Your homework now is for you to go and then begin to think out of the box. What could go wrong at each one of those respective stages? And that is to say, what are the potential risks that could occur within each one of these stages? And that's exactly what we're going to pick in our next session. So with that having been said, I think I've given you quite a mouthful for today's session as an introduction. Um, at the stage now where I can take any form of questions, clarifications, uh, comments from you colleagues. Anybody with a question? Um, no, I don't have any questions. Okay. Mine um, is not necessarily related to the topic, it's related to the timetable. Are we oh, able okay. to get the that, time that is 